We're going to be building this $1,000 gaming PC from scratch, showing you how you can do it at home yourself, as well as installing Windows, getting games set up, and showing you how it performs in the latest titles. The primary parts of this build are Intel's brand new i5-12400F and the NVIDIA RTX 3050. The 12400F is Intel's brand new Alder Lake architecture, having six of their brand new performance colors. The RTX 3050 is going to be perfect for 1080p gaming, and it has 8 gigabytes of VRAM and supports all of the latest NVIDIA features like ray tracing DLSS, as well as the good NVENC encoder. For the motherboard, we're going with the ASUS Prime B660M-A AC motherboard because it's micro ATX, which means that we can fit it into a smaller system, but also it has Wi-Fi built into it so that we don't have to worry about spending money on a dongle later on. A good practice when building your PC is to do it outside the case first to ensure all of the components work, and doing it on the motherboard box is the best place to do it because it's non-conductive. In your CPU box, you're going to get two parts. If you're following along exactly with this build, you're going to get your CPU cooler, which we're going to use later, as well as the CPU at the top of the box. So at this stage, you can either install the RAM or the CPU. I like to start with the CPU, and that's as easy as taking it out of the plastic clamshell. And then you're going to want to identify which portion of the CPU has the golden triangle in the corner, which is right here. And then you're going to align that with the triangle that's actually on your motherboard. You lift the retention arm like so, open up the socket, placing it down gently. Do not apply any pressure after the fact. Maybe just give it a slight wiggle to make sure it's in there. Lower this portion right here push it down until it's under the socket. That is supposed to happen. That's some very violent popping. And then you take the retention arm and put it back under. Now the CPU is fully installed. One of the most important things to remember is to take this socket cover and to put it in your motherboard box, because if anything happens to the motherboard and you need to send it back to the retailer, you're gonna wanna put this on the socket, otherwise they won't accept your return. Now at this stage, you have two choices. You can either install the CPU cooler or you can install the RAM. I personally like to install the RAM first, especially when installing other CPU coolers, because there might be a clearance issue where the cooler hits the RAM and you don't find out till afterwards. So the RAM we're actually going to be using is 16 gigabytes of this Oloy Blade RGB. It's DDR4, 3600 megahertz, and it's relatively simple to install. This motherboard has four slots, so we have room for upgrading later, but the good mentality to have here is that you install it in the second and fourth slot, so that way you get dual channel RAM. And you just make sure that you align the notch with the notch that's actually in the motherboard and slightly press it down, especially until it clicks on the side that has a latch. With the stock cooler, we don't have to worry about thermal paste because it's actually already on the copper slug. However, in case you find that you have bad CPU temps, that might be one of the first things you might consider replacing. Since Intel's mounting orientation is a square, the most important thing is making sure that the fan cable actually lines up with the fan input that's on the motherboard. You see right here, it says CPU fan, and it's just as easy as plugging it in like that. And I like to make sure that the cable is as taut as it possibly can be just for cable management later, but it's just as easy as pushing down the pins, making sure that it's actually on the CPU and popping them down because they're push pins. For the storage, we're going with one terabyte of the Samsung 970 EVO Plus. Where you install your M.2 SSD will vary from motherboard to motherboard. On our motherboard, we only have one slot, so it's as easy as uninstalling the actual cover, inserting the contacts against the contacts on the board, pressing down the actual SSD, and then reinstalling the cover. But sometimes you have to make sure to remove the actual sticker that's on the backside of the thermal pad. Now we have the board prepped and ready to go in the case. The CPU, the RAM, and the SSD are all installed, and so we get the case out next. So for the case, we have the fractal design of Focus Mini G. It's got a mesh front, which is going to allow for okay airflow. However, it does have a windowed side panel so that you can see all the components that you're going to install. Now to prep the case, is it simple as taking off the screws that are on the side of each side, probably using a screwdriver. And nearly all cases are going to come with all of these connectors, which are going to attach your motherboard and make sure that things like the front USB, as well as all the power buttons work. And then you will also get this box, which is filled with screws that you're going to need to install everything. Some cases have a power supply basement that forces you to install it from the backside. This one's a little different. It has an open power supply section, so we install it over here, but the power supply we're gonna be using is the EVGA 600BQ. It's gonna be semi-modular, so that way we don't have to install 
all of the cables, but we do have some that are pre-attached and it's gonna go down here. However, because we do not have a power supply basement, what we're gonna encounter is the fact that we're gonna have all of these stickers sticking out. So there's three methods of thought here. You can either endure the stickers looking really weird, you can take them off with a heat gun and making sure that's taken care of, or if you wanna go the extra level, you can install some vinyl wrap to cover all of that up and potentially have it blend in. Once the sticker's heated up, it should just come off nicely and hardly leave any residue. Besides blood, as mentioned before, one of the great things about semi-modular or modular power supplies is that you don't have to use all of the cables to save some room, especially in a case that doesn't have a power supply basement. So we don't need this peripheral set. We only need the cable that's going to be connecting to the graphics card, and you just plug it in right there. However, for a rather cheap visual upgrade, we're also going to be adding in some cable extensions. The most important thing with the power supply is making sure that the fan is actually getting some airflow and since the bottom of our case is ventilated installing it like this will work perfectly the case has plenty of places for you to align the holes and the power supply should come with the screws that you use in order to screw it in and secure the power supply to the case before we install the motherboard into the case I want to make sure that we know where all of our cables are going which is why I put the power supply in first but then also because we only have two fans at the front of the case I'm gonna install some extra fans to make sure that we get better airflow this five pack was only $25 so it doesn't add a whole lot to the extra budget, but it's gonna make sure that the components in this PC build stay nice and cool. For fan installation, you wanna think about where the air is blowing. Typically with fans, the air pushes towards the back. So if we install the fan like this, it's going to be blowing the air out of the case. However, you can see here, the front fans are taking air and pushing it through the case. We could also potentially intake here at the top, but my choice is to intake through the front, exhaust out of the top and the back over here. Because we installed five fans and you'll struggle to find that many ports on a lot of motherboards, we picked up a fan hub which is going to allow us to cable manage all of the fans in the back of the case without having to take up all of the ports that are on the motherboard. Now we've come to the time where we install the motherboard into the case. However, because we went with a budget case here, the actual standoffs are not installed into the case, so we have to do that ourselves. We need to find the points where the motherboard will actually be sitting on the standoffs and then verify that they're actually installed at every point in the case. And because they're threaded, they just get screwed in. Thankfully, Fractal Design includes this adapter which allows you to connect it to your screwdriver and then tighten the standoffs down. From the motherboard box, you wanna grab the IO shield and then install it over here, making sure that you get the four corners placed and then just gently pop them in, making sure that they're aligned. But don't do what I just did, which was, install it upside down. So lowering it in at an angle, I like to hold it by the CPU cooler because that's the sturdiest part. You wanna make sure you line up all of the parts in the motherboard to the parts of the IO shield and place it down and make sure that it's on the standoffs. Then you take the screws that came with the case and start screwing down the motherboard to make sure that it's secure. So for all of these front panel connectors like the power, the reset, the front audio, as well as the USB, you have these connectors that came with the case. So this is probably the most complicated portion of the install but thankfully both the actual motherboard has all of the labels here as well as your motherboard manual you're just going to find where the power switch and everything goes into however one of the things you should remember is that these don't matter which one's positive or negative you just need to get them installed in the correct section and then you're good to go usb3 you align the notch with the bottom there and you plug it in straight on usb2 is right next to it you make sure the notch is connected where the pin is missing and it goes straight down in hd audio is usually towards the other side of the motherboard missing that pin right there and it just plugs straight in the same motherboard and cpu power up next again find the notch find it on the side of the motherboard power and then just push the cable straight down into it before we get video so now that we're ready to install the gpu it's time to make sure that the graphics card goes into the correct slot which here is going to be the top one i like to just verify beforehand to make sure we're uninstalling the correct slots here that come with the case to make sure it goes in properly first step press this clip back here line up the gpu to make sure that it's going to go in now that it's aligned and partially in just push it straight in and now it's time to screw this side and then plug in the PCI Express power right there. Once all the cables are managed, you just put the side panels back on and then you enjoy your PC. If you have to fight the cables, just make sure to adjust them, try to get them in a place where they're not necessarily pushing, pushing up against the side panel. But uh, also don't be afraid to give it a little, you know, 
So the PC build is now complete and cable managed. We actually ended up adding some white LEDs down here at the bottom and at the top just to illuminate the inside. They're a little bit more purple than what I was expecting. That's what happens when you get cheap LEDs, but now is the best time of any PC build, the peel. Now that the PC is assembled, it's time to get it set up. So first things first is turning it on and getting into the BIOS so that we can configure the RAM to make sure we're getting the most speed out of it. And the way you do that is by spamming the delete key. So as you can see here, the RAM is currently set to 2400 megahertz, even though the RAM we purchased is rated for 3600. So it's as simple as coming down here and clicking enable on XMP, which then shows you that DDR4 is gonna be running at 3600 megahertz. You can also go into advanced mode in the BIOS, and then you'll have all of the options available to you. And you can go over to things like AI tweaker, it varies from motherboard to motherboard, but you wanna set the XMP profile to be at the rated RAM speed so that we get the most performance out of the actual computer. So now is the time to install Windows. It's actually really simple and all you need is a USB because you go down to Windows website, you download the ISO for Windows 10 or Windows 11 if that's your vibe. I personally don't like Windows 11 at this point, but you download the ISO onto the USB and you plug it into your computer. Now you wanna have this plugged in before you boot up your device for the first time so that it'll actually take you to the Windows boot menu. You don't have to go into the BIOS to load it. It should just boot to it all automatically and you'll know it's working once it starts the windows loading circles that appear down here you'll be greeted with this setup page you make sure that the language and all of that is set to your specifications and you click install now it'll start the setup and here's where you can enter the windows activation key if you have one if you don't you can come back to it later by clicking on i don't have a product key that'll move on to showing you which operating system you want to install whether it's windows 10 home or windows 10 pro pro doesn't really have any features that the average consumer is going to need. So home should be just fine. You can accept the license terms. From here, you're gonna to wanna to go into custom install windows only. And you can see we have the unallocated drive space of our SSD that's in there. Click on the drive, you click next, and it will begin the process of installing windows. Now comes the issue of getting drivers set up. Sometimes you're lucky, windows will install the drivers. Sometimes you're not, and you might actually have to download the drivers from the motherboard website which you can do by using the USB that you installed Windows on. A lot of motherboards will actually include a DVD that includes all of the drivers, but nobody has DVD drives anymore, so it doesn't really, it's not helpful. Include USBs, motherboard manufacturers. So we've tested the computer, and boy, howdy, does it perform good. We've got some decent benchmark numbers to share with you. So Horizon Zero Dawn is what we're playing in courtesy of Horizon Forbidden West just coming out, and we average 100.8 FPS at 1080p, medium. God of War, we average 93.5 FPS. In Fortnite, you don't have to worry, my friends, you're going to average 183.5 FPS at 1080p medium. Valorant, if you're looking for a high frame rate esports title, the 12400F that's in this system can handle it, pumping up those numbers to 328 FPS average. Red Dead Redemption 2, we manage 104 FPS, and in Cyberpunk 2077, which was the most demanding title, we average 65 point for FPS. So overall, in basically any AAA or modern eSports titles, you're going to get at least 60 FPS or 144. So this is a solid PC that you get for $1,000. In case you want to see what you can get for a budget of only $300, click this video right here to find out about this $300 build.